هذا القرآن يوحدنا لطريق الخير يوجبنا الله تعالى أنزله ورسول الله معلمنا ورسول الله معلمنا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد ما جاء بعض السستر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته let me apologize for being late, first of all. Uh, what ended up happening was, since the, the snow was coming down, my windshield actually froze. So I thought I could get straight into my car and you know come straight to the masjid. But then as I started to drive, I noticed that I wasn't able to see. <laughs> so I had to pull over on the side of the road and you know scrape it off and wait for it to melt off. And that's what caused me to be late. We're going to start off by talking about food. You know, I know it's dinner time. Some of you may have not eaten. Some of you, you know, may have eaten already. But I remember my time in Medina as a bachelor, you know, it was a, a very fun time that we would survive off of uh, amazing things, subhanAllah. So I remember that in the university itself, you had one of two options. You could either eat at the university canteen, the university restaurant, or they had like an outside restaurant that was catered outside. And I'll tell you about both of them. The first one, the university canteen, I survived there for three days. For three days I had breakfast, lunch and dinner there. Then I remember on the fourth day, after Salat al-Fajr, I went there and I saw one of the most atrocious things. There was a brother that, you know, had just finished mopping the floor. And he had just mopped the whole thing because the whole floor was just wet. I saw him take this mop <laughs> and he started mopping our trays with it. Now, <laughs> now hold on, let me explain why that's bad. These are like these old school trays. They're not like the plastic trays you get here. These are metal trays that they put the food directly onto. So there's no point to that. After I saw that, I'm like, I can never eat here again. And I'm really surprised no one's died of sickness or anything like that. Now the second situation was the university canteen, uh, the university restaurant. This was like an outside catering company. And this outside catering company, it was, I don't know what was wrong with them. They tried to cut corners every way possible. I clearly remember, you know, like once walking in and they had like this pea, uh, this piece of like pasta. It was like baked macaroni or something like that. And no one was buying it. And you know, I didn't come back until after the weekend was over. I came back and that piece was still there. <laughs> and I'm like, what is this doing here? And you know, it was like one of those places. So even that you couldn't eat. So eventually, you know, the students have to find their own way. And I remember, you know, literally, literally for a year and a half, this is like, uh, for those of you who remember Sheikh Hassan, Sheikh Hassan used to live upstairs on the third floor and I used to live on the second floor in the same building. And I would go up to his place for dinner and he, would, he had like a, a small stove and we would have like pasta and like different things. He had variety, that was dinner time at night. And then for lunch they would come to my room and we had the same thing for a year which was uh, tuna, mayonnaise, and, and sweet corn <laughs> for one year. Now, why am I mentioning this? Like in the bachelor days, you're not too picky because you have to survive, you know, you do what you have to survive. Now when you get married, all of a sudden your expectations go a bit higher. And I remember, I'll tell you something interesting this week. You know, mashallah, tabarakallah, my, my wife is a, an exceptional cook, an exceptional cook. And since she is such a good cook, if she ever has an off day, like she doesn't make something properly, I get upset at that. I'm like, what's wrong with you? Why don't you know how to cook properly? And the reason why that happens is because there's a level of consistency that you know she has such a high standard that the day that she comes down to normal, that the bachelor individual, he would love to have this food, the person who is used to something better, he doesn't appreciate it. Now why do I mention this? It's because as I was thinking about this, I was like, SubhanAllah, Look at the blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides for us. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as we'll come to see, when we call him as-samad and al-ahad, these two unique characteristics of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is about providing for his creation at a consistent level. Meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides us with greatness and with excellence and with perfection each and every single time. There's no fluctuation in the performance or delivery of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's what I wanted to start off with today. That today we're discussing Surah Al-Ikhlas, 
And this surah is called Surah Al-Ikhlas because it deals purely with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It deals with no one other than Allah. It does not deal with the dunya, it does not deal with any fiqh. It purely deals with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is why this is called Surah Al-Ikhlas. Because it is purely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. This surah was also called Surah Al-Tawheed. It was also called Surah Al-Tawheed. And it is called Surah Al-Tawheed because it deals with the essence of Tawheed. The essence of Tawheed being the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it was called Surah Al-Ikhlas because it's only about Allah. And it is called Surah Al-Tawheed as well because it talks about the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Now getting into the virtues of this surah, there are quite a few virtues. There are quite a few virtues in this surah. I want to start off by mentioning the textual virtues of this surah. The textual virtues of the surah. Number one, the first textual virtue of this surah is as is narrated in Sahih Muslim. The Prophet ﷺ calls it Thuluthul Qur'an. It is one third of the Qur'an. Meaning that the message in this surah is the message of one third of the Qur'an. And if you were to look at the whole Qur'an, the Qur'an can be divided into three sections. The Qur'an can be divided into three sections. It is divided into uh, rules and regulations, meaning ahkam, so it's rules and regulations. Then number two, it deals with promises and punishments, meaning Jannah and Nar, and the people of Jannah and, uh, and Jahannam. That is the second section. And then the third section is Aqidah. The third section is about Tawheed. The third section is about Creed and our belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the fact that this surah deals solely with belief, that is why it is equivalent to one third of the Quran. It is equivalent to one third of the Quran. Now one should not think that by reading this surah, one will get the reward of reading one third of the Quran. Meaning that if you recite this surah three times, you've read the whole Quran. That is not the message behind the hadith. The message behind the hadith is the mess is the spirit behind the surah, meaning that it deals with aqidah, and the aqidah is one third of the message of the Quran after rules and regulations, and then dealing with the promises and punishments that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about. So that is the first virtue, that it is one third of the Quran. The second virtue of this is that there is a companion that used to recite the surah in every single salah, every single salah. And one day his people came to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they started complaining. They said, Ya Rasulullah, it's as if this man knows no other part of the Qur'an. That he always recites this surah. Can you please speak to him on our behalf that he recites something else? So the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam calls this man over and he asks him, why do you do this? So this man responded by saying, I do this because this surah talks about Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and I love Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And that is why I recited this surah all the time. So the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that know that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala loves you as well. So the scholars like al hafidh ibn Rajab, they derive from this is that part of love of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is loving this surah. And a person who loves this surah in particular will attain the love of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So one of the ways of attaining the love of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is loving the surah and loving the message behind the surah. That is the second virtue of this surah. A third virtue of this surah is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made this surah and another surah the most oft recited surahs after Surah Al-Fatiha. That if you look in terms of recitation, the three most oft recited surahs that any Muslim recites is Surah Fatiha. That's a given because you have to recite it. But what are number two and number three? Number two and number three, without a shadow of a doubt, are in Aqayna Kal Kawtha and Surah Al Ikhlas. Now we laugh at this because we do this out of laziness, we do this because we're in a hurry, but it is actually a miracle from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. It is an actual miracle from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So now, why did Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala make these the two most oft recited surahs after Surah Al Fatiha? If you were to look at the message of both of them, and here I'm quoting one of the scholars of uh, Tafsir, Imam Al-Razi, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. He says that if you look at the message of these two surahs, what is the message of these two surahs? Inna a'tayna kal kawthar is a defense of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is being defended from the allegations of the Quraysh. Meaning that the allegations of the Quraysh were that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't have any male children. Or in fact, 
that uh, you know he, his lineage would not continue. And this is what they criticized him for. And this was a deficiency according to their custom. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this surah by saying, Inna shani'aka huwa abta that the one who criticizes you, the one who curses you, he is the one that will be cut off. He is the one that will not be remembered. So in the al kawthar is a defense of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Qul huwa Allahu ahad is a defense of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning that those people that said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had a child, or that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was born, or that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a, had, had a wife, just like the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was defended, then the surah came to defend Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what's interesting over here is that just like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, defended the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, here the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is being commanded to defend Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is a very important point. That living in a time where you know secularism is so rampant and atheism is rampant and you know veneration of God and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is negligent and does not exist. It is important to remember that it is our responsibility to defend morality and to defend Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because this is what the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was commanded with in this surah. Another point of reflection that Imam al-Razi mentions on this surah is that look at how different Allah and the creation are. That in the creation, if you don't have children, this becomes a point of deficiency. It becomes a, a defect in the human being. But when you attribute a child to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this becomes an attribution of a defect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So a perfect God will be a God that has no offspring and has no partners, and the perfect human being will be the one that has a continued lineage with children. So the Imam al-Razi points out this difference between the God and the creation as well. A fourth benefit, actually that would be number, this will be number five, no, this will be number five. Number three was as oft repeated, and number four was that it is a defense of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the fifth benefit pertaining to Surah Al-Ikhlas is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala literally made dependent on this Surah the protection of the Qur'an. The protection of the Qur'an. How is that so? You'll notice that these last three Surahs that we've covered, they all started off with Qul. They all started off with Qul. Guys, I need you guys to stop talking. They all started off with Qul. Now what is the significance of starting off with Qul? Because you'll notice that throughout history, people have discussed, was the Qur'an preserved in wording and in meaning, or by meaning only? So you had fractions of Muslims, you had sects of Muslims that said that the Qur'an was only preserved in meaning. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inspired the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam He spoke the Qur'an as he pleased, as he understood. But in these three surahs that we've discussed is a clear evidence that the Qur'an is preserved in wording and in meaning. Because had it been in meaning only, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would not teach us this surah by starting off by Qul, it would not start off by Qul, it would just go into Allahu Ahad, Allahu Samad. But rather, the fact that we say Qul is a clear evidence that this Quran was preserved in wording and in meaning. That the Surah was preserved in wording and in meaning. And those are the five virtues of the Surah. And like I said, there are many, many more. But those are the five that I want to share with you. Now I'll emphasize this within the Ta'ala next week. You will be tested on that. You will be tested on that. We will have some prizes. And we may also have some punishments. So be careful, inshallah. Tayyip, let us get into some details about this surah. Let us get into some details about this surah. The first detail about this surah is was this surah revealed in Mecca or in Medina? Was this surah revealed in Mecca and or in Medina? Who can tell me where it was revealed and why? Where was it revealed in Mecca? It was revealed in Mecca. Why? Why do you say that? No worries, go ahead. Ayub. It was revealed in Mecca since it's responding to the Kufar who were making fun of the Prophet Wasallam because he had no male children. That's it. And now I'm playing at the Oh, <laughs> that's what the little us. Okay. Well, because the, uh, the Mushikun or the Kufar came to the Prophet and they asked him, What did the lineage 
of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. So that is the reason behind the revelation, but that doesn't prove it was revealed in Mecca. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, last one. Um, maybe like in Mecca, that's the, I think, maybe in Mecca, it's uh, Allah's house there. Mm -hmm. Okay. In fact, there's a difference of opinion. In fact, there's a difference of opinion. The vast majority of scholars from the early scholars from the Sahaba, they said that this surah was revealed in Mecca. This surah was revealed in Mecca. This was one of the two opinions of Abdullah bin Abbas. This was the opinion of Abdullah bin Mas'ud. This was the opinion of the students of Ibn Mas'ud, like Tawus and Mujahid and other than them. So this is the first opinion. The second opinion was the Rawaya of Ibn Abbas that it was revealed in Medina and this was an opinion of some of his other students as well. But the majority of scholars held that it was a Makkan Surah. Now why do we believe it was a Makkan Surah? We believe it was a Makkan Surah because of the nature of the Surahs. So if you were to look at the Makkan Surahs versus the Madani Surahs, you would notice that the Makkan Surahs predominantly deal with dealing with faith and increasing Iman. Whereas the Madani Surahs, they deal with fiqh and rulings. They deal with rules and regulations. Number two, the Madani Surahs are actually quite long. Whereas the Makki Surahs are quite short. And that is why you notice that Juz Amma, the vast majority of it is Makki. And they are the shortest Surahs in the Quran. So these are two predominant reasons why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. It seems that it is a Makki Surah. The third and most important reason why we believe it is a Makki Surah is because of the crucial message behind the surah. That this is like the very essence of Islam. So it seems that, generally speaking, it would be one of the first surahs revealed as it describes and talks about who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. Now, as our brother Ayub mentioned, what was the reason behind the revelation of the surah? Why did this surah come down? The surah came down as it reported in the Muslim, the Imam Ahmad, rahimahullah, that the mushrikun, they came asking, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam What is the lineage of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala? What is the lineage of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala? Meaning who were Allah's ancestors and great grandfathers and all of that? And this shows you something SubhanAllah One, the mentality of the people That it was common for the people to worship the creation It was common for the people to worship the creation And that is why they would come and ask for the lineage Number two Is that how forgotten the concept of oneness had, you know, had disappeared. I mean, this concept of being Hanif, of worshipping your creator, it had completely disappeared. And it was replaced by worshipping the creation. It was replaced by worshipping the creation, particularly that which was already alive and had a lineage. So this shows you two important things. So the Muslim of Imam Ahmad, the Prophet ﷺ was asked, who is, you know, what is the lineage of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And that is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent this surah down. That is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent this surah down. Now let us get into the text of the surah itself. Let us get into the text of the surah itself. So the surah starts off with Qul hu Allahu ahad. So as we mentioned, Qul is to say. And as we mentioned in the previous surahs, this was a command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa himself that this is how he is to teach it to the people. That the reason we mention Qul is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us to do so. And this is how the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa taught his companions to do so. Then who Allah? That he is Allah. He is Allah. Now who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Where does it come from? If you go back to our study of Surah Al-Fatiha, we mentioned that Allah comes from Al-Ilah. Al-Ilah. That there are two or three different opinions on the name Allah. And that the correct opinion that we took is that Allah comes from an ilah, meaning that it is a conjunction of these two, meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that is worshipped. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that is worshipped. So when we discuss tawheed, we talk about how there are three categories of tawheed. Tawheed of the worshipping of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or tawheed al-uluhiyya. Then tawheed in the lordship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is tawheed al rububiya and then the third type of Tawheed is Tawheed of Asma wa Sifat or the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts off this surah at the very beginning talking about the importance of worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Al-Ilah. He is the object of all of your worship. He is the one that you direct all of your worship to. So that is who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. Allah is also the most perfect name of all of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
As we discussed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has an infinite amount of names. Amount of names that we do not know. And all of those names are encompassed by the name Allah. Because the one that possesses all of these names and all of these attributes is the one that is deserving of our worship. And likewise, if we direct our worship towards something or someone, then it has to have all of these names and attributes as well. So it is the most perfect name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number three. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or the name Allah, is the name that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala possibly created as the greatest name. What do we mean by that? If you go back to our tafsir surah Fatiha, we mentioned that the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he used to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he would make dua, Oh Allah, I ask you by the name, that if you are asked by it, you do not reject dua. That if you are asked by this name, you do not reject dua. And then we mentioned that the scholars were of two opinions on this. One was Allah, and what was the second opinion? Does anyone remember? <laughs> Ahsant. The second opinion was the combination between Al-Hay and Al-Qayyum. A combination between Al-Hay and Al-Qayyum. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best with the correct opinion, or the one closer to the truth, seeing that it was the name Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is who Allah is. Then we go on to the first attribute or title that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned and that is Ahad that is Ahad now this is interesting over here because you'll notice that while this is one of the shortest surahs probably the second shortest surah in the Quran <clears throat> it has two names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that are not mentioned in any other surah two names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that are not mentioned in any other surah they are Ahad and As-Samad these two names are not mentioned in any other surah, even though this is one of the shortest surahs in the Quran. Now what does Ahad actually mean? If you were to look at the Arabic language, you would see that there's two terms that can be used for one. You can use Ahad and you can use Wahid. And then you can notice when it comes to the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has three names that are derived from this concept. You have Ahad, Wahid, and Wahid. Ahad, Wahid, and Wahid. Now this concept of oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The vast majority of scholars of tafsir, they said that Ahad and Wahid are exactly the same. That there's no distinction between these two terms. But in reality, if you were to look at it, there is a distinction. There's a very big distinction. That when you count in the Arabic language, you start off by saying Wahid, Ithnain, Thalatha, Arba, Khamsa, Sita, till the end of it. But you never start off by saying, Ahad, Ithnain, Thalatha. So clearly this shows you that there is a distinction. Now what is the distinction? Now, the distinction is that when you talk about something which is Wahid, it is one of many. So if someone is in a race, he finishes first out of many competitors. But if someone is Ahad, then Ahad means that there was no one else in this race to begin with. He was the one and only and that is how it is described to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Ahad is the one and only. That there was no one else mentioned and there's no one else like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is the difference between Ahad and Wahid. That Wahid is one of many. Whereas Ahad is the one and only. And you'll notice that when it comes to some of the characteristics of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there are some characteristics that are only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whereas there are other characteristics that even the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shares in those characteristics. And we'll come to that discussion later on. And here's like an important tangent to understand. That you'll notice in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes uses the plural. So he'll say, وَخَلَقَنَا insan That we created mankind. وَأَنزَلْنَا Quran, And we sent down the Quran. Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala use the plural over here? If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is only one. This is a question for the audience. Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala use the plural if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is only one? Go ahead. In some languages, we is a term of respect. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says we, he's saying it as a term of respect towards himself. Excellent. So number one, it is a we of royalty. And you know that, you know, when you even hear the queen speak, she's like, we did this and we did that, even though she's one. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is more deserving of this glorification and magnification. So this is a way of royalty that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses. 
But there's a further reasoning behind it. There's a second reasoning behind it. And I believe this is more important to understand. Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala use the plural sometimes in the Quran? Go ahead. Angels are involved in that, so that's the reason why. Ahsan, excellent. That is the reason behind it. So you'll notice that in certain incidents or in certain actions, the angels are involved or the creation is involved. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the creation of the human being, we all agree and believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created all of us. But did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala create us directly? No, He didn't. We were born through our parents. So that's where the human being has a share in this creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you'll notice that the revelation of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke the Quran and gave it to Jibreel or spoke it to Jibreel. And it was Jibreel who revealed it to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So that is why when the inzal of the Quran is mentioned, it is a plural because Jibreel had a part in it as well. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking on behalf of that whole realm. So you will notice that the times where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses we, for the vast majority of the times, it's because the angels or the creation have a share in that act. But what's interesting to note is that when it comes to the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the plural is never mentioned. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never say and worship us or direct your ibadah towards us. Go ahead. That's good except for the ayah, both for ibadana Ibrahim or Ishaqa wa Yaquba. So what's wrong with that ayah? Ibadana. Ibadana, meaning our worshippers. Hmm. Worshippers is plural. So all of these prophets that are mentioned are the worshippers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No, no. Ibadana are worshippers. Uh -huh. So we said that, let's see, uh, Nahab is with the angels or? Okay, you're talking about Ibadana over here. Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mention the plural over here? Good question. Mm -hmm. That's something interesting to look into. Look into it and then let's find out inshallah. inshallah. But that's a very good point inshallah. Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mention the plural over here? Ibadana. What was that? What was the content? I will have to look it up inshallah, but we'll look that up in night time. But one of the things I can refer to think about over here is that what is the point of this verse over here? The first there is in that machine. Yeah, that, that, that's very possible. That's very possible. So over here, that the, pur the purpose behind this verse is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not talking about worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but rather He's talking about the worshippers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm. And that's the point that I was trying to make, is that while Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioning these worshippers, is not talking about that they directed the worship to other anyone other than Allah. Mm. But rather these were the worshippers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it could be a way of royalty over here. That could be possible. Or number two is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding the creation who the worshippers are. So these were these were the ones that worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's possible. Again, we can look into it, but I'm sure there's a, a different understanding of this. And Allah knows best. So that is why sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the plural. Now, getting into, again, this concept of Ahad and Wahid and Wahid, one of the key distinctions, again, that needs to be made is that, so what are the things that human beings have a share in, what are, and what are the things that human beings do not have a share in? So you'll notice that when it comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, while Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does some of these actions, they are done in a way that is befitting of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're done in a way that is befitting of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when mankind does them, they are done in a way that is befitting of the creation itself. And I'll explain this towards the ending of the surah. So that is where Ahad comes from. So then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on into verse number two. Allahu as samad That Allah is as samad as samad linguistically comes from two meanings. The linguistic meaning of as samad it means two things. Number one, it is an object that you desire. A samad is an object that you desire. And then the second meaning is that it is something which is uh, like not movable and something that is very rigid. Something that is not movable and something that is very rigid. And then the scholars discussing these linguistic meanings of the word samad, they said both of them apply to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but the first one applies more than the second. So the first one being that as-samad is that which is desired. And this is, uh, you know, the second name in the surah that is only in the surah. It's not mentioned anywhere else in the Quran. And it is one of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the creation cannot be named with. 
So for example, when we were discussing the tafsir of Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, we mentioned that the creation can be named Rahim, but he can't be named Rahman. Because Rahman is the one that owns and possesses all mercy. Similarly, the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can be named Kareem, but they cannot be named as Samad. They can be named Kareem, but they cannot be named as Samad. And we'll come to see what the actual uh, contextual meaning of as Samad is. So now in terms of the Shar'i meaning of as Samad, the scholars of Tafsir had many, many meanings. In fact, you would find over, you know, close to 10 meanings of the word as Samad. What we want to take is the three most popular meanings. The three most popular meanings. The first meaning is that a samad is the one that does not eat or drink. And this is the tafsir of Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu anhu. A samad is the one that does not eat or drink. Meaning that he is not in need of his creation, he is not in need of anything, he is the one that can survive without anything. That is what a samad is. Then number two, the second meaning of a samad. This was the opinion of Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala. Is that a samad is the one that everyone turns to and that he turns to no one. So a samad is the one that everyone turns to and he turns to no one. Meaning that at ultimate times of despair, in ultimate times of need, who does one turn to? It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is why you will see that, you know, la qadar Allah, if anyone's falling out of a plane or the plane is sinking or you've fallen off of a building, you're making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sincerely. Because that is what the heart is calling to. To call out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That natural reaction, this is turning towards a samad Meaning that people are compelled to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in times of adversity and in times of difficulty. And then the third popular opinion, the third popular opinion, go ahead. Uh, there was a place that called Samadhi. Okay. Is that okay? Like I know you can't say you can't call somebody Samad, but Abdul Samad, yes. Right. Samad. Allahu Alam. What does that mean? It's a famous place. There was a famous pastry place there. Allah knows best. I don't know. I don't know. So, the, the, third, the third opinion, and we'll save all questions till the end, inshallah. Save all your questions till the end. So, the third opinion when it comes to a Samad is that a samad is the one that it does not beget, nor is he begotten. Meaning, repeating the last verse that we're going to come up to. That it is a repetition of the last verse, but in one, in, in one word. So you'll notice that here, the scholars mention the eloquence of the Qur'an. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He delivers the same message twice. The first message, He delivers it through a samad, meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't have any children, nor does He have any parents. And you'll notice Allah repeats that again in the last verse. So the, they said that that is what a samad means. That is what a samad means. And this was attributed to some of the early scholars of Islam as well. Now for our intents and purposes, the, the opinion that we're taking is the second opinion. And that is the opinion of Ibn al-Qaim. And the reason why we take this opinion is because it sums up all of the other opinions. That you'll notice the eight or nine or ten different opinions that are mentioned. This opinion of Ibn al-Qaim, that it is the one that all of the creation turns to and he turns to none of his creation it encompasses all of this all of those opinions in one opinion and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best that that is the correct opinion then we move on to the next verse that lam yalid wa lam yulad lam yalid wa lam yulad now the scholars of the Quran they actually differed is lam yalid wa lam yulad one verse of the Quran or is it two verses is it one verse of the Qur'an or is it two verses? So the vast majority of the Qur'an, they said that it is one verse. It is recited straight, lam yalid wa lam yulad straight, without a break in between. But the scholars of Asham and the scholars of Mecca, the scholars of Asham and the scholars of Mecca, they said that lam yalid wa lam yulad is actually two verses. It's actually two verses. Meaning that Surah Al-Ikhlas would then have five verses as opposed to four. It would have five verses as opposed to four. Now for some of us, this may seem very shocking. You know, how can someone change the number of verses in the Quran? And this is something that is very important to understand, that when it comes to the numbering of the verses of the Quran, some of them were done by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and some of them were done through the ijtihad of the companions. And some of them were done through the ijtihad of the companions. And it seems that this is one of those surahs. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not specify would this be four verses or five verses. 
And then we want to look at the practical value of it. From our perspective, when we are reciting the surah, will it actually make a difference if we recite it in four verses or five verses? No, it doesn't make a difference at all. Because the message is exactly the same. So you'll notice that at times, even when you study Orientalist studies, these are one of the things they will bring against the Qur'an. That the numbering of the Qur'an is inconsistent. And then our response to this is that the numbering of the Qur'an is irrelevant to us. What is relevant to us is the message of the Qur'an. That the message of the Qur'an is exactly the same. The wording of the Qur'an is exactly the same. Whether the numbers change or not, this is something trivial and does not make much of a difference. And I'll, note, I'll tell you my first, the first shock I ever had. So I remember that when I first arrived in Medina, you know, mashallah, it was a very special experience. They give you a, a tour of Al-Masjid al-Nabwi, and there's like a small museum inside Al-Masjid al-Nabwi that they give to like VIPs. So that was like a very nice experience. Then one of the second things we did was we went to the Qur'an printing complex, the Qur'an printing complex in Medina. And then going to this Qur'an printing complex in Medina, you know, they give you a free copy of the Qur'an. So, you know, some people are asking English, we had some Bosnian students asking for a Bosnian translation, the Chinese students are asking for Chinese translation. I'm like, I already have an English translation, I want to, you know, get another translation. And for some reason, at, at that time, I was trying to learn Spanish. I'm not going to get into the reasons behind that, but I was trying to learn Spanish. So I was like, you know what, let me get a Spanish Quran. So I get the Spanish translation of the Quran, and then I open up Surah Al-Baqarah. How many verses Surah Al-Baqarah meant to have? Who can tell me? 286 verses. That's how many verses are supposed to be in Surah Al-Baqarah. I open up the Spanish translation, and there's 287. And you know, the audacity that I had at the time, I was like, shake, 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 they made a mistake. In the <laughs> and then I looked like such a fool at the time. Because it's kind of like, you have like major scholars, you know, revising this and going through it. But you'll notice that in the Spanish translation, the Quran Surah the Baqarah has 287 verses. Again, mentioning the fact that the number of the verses is completely trivial. It does not make a difference. What's important to us is the wording. What is important to us is the wording. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. What does this mean? He begets not, nor was he begotten. Lam yadid, meaning that he does not have any children. He does not have any children. And I want to mention over here, one of the great um, you know, scholars that defended Islam against Christianity. He defended Islam against Christianity. His name was Imam al-Baqidani, and he died somewhere around 491. So, in this, we're in like, around the Spain area, somewhere in Europe at that time, Imam al-Baqidani is a scholar of the Qur'an, a scholar of the Arabic language, and one of the scholars of Aqidah, uh, you know, with his differences in opinion, that's a different issue, but the Christians invited him, they invited him, and they said, you know, you being a great scholar of Islam, we would like to invite you to this blessed gathering of ours, where our head bishop or our head priest is going to be there. So what was interesting is that they had intentionally put the door really, really low. Meaning that, you know, the door instead of being like six feet tall, so the average person can enter, it was, you know, shorter than that. It was maybe about like five, eight, five, nine. Meaning that when you entered, you had to put your head down, and that is where the priest is sitting. So it was the way of uh, compelling people to show respect to their priest. <laughs> so now Imam al he realizes this, he's watching people going, he's like, what's going on? Why would they create such a small door? He sees the priest sitting there, so what does he do? He enters the door backwards. <laughs> but that's not the interesting part. That's not the interesting part. The interesting part is that he walks in and you know they put him next to the head priest and he starts talking to with the head priest and he starts off with, to talk, by talking to the priest, you know, how are you? How is your wife and how are your kids? And this inside the Christian church is blasphemy because they're all supposed to be celibate. They're not supposed to be getting married. So they, all the, the people, they start getting angry and upset. They're like, how dare you criticize our priest by asking about his wife and children? And then Imam Baqan, he, says, he stands up and says, how dare you attribute these same defects to your very creator? Meaning that if it is a defect for your priest to have it, then how about attributing it to God himself? And this was like, you know, one of the great debates that took place between Islam and Christianity, between Imam al-Baqadani and the, the Christians of Spain. But this is the point of this verse. This is the point of this verse. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is emphasizing this very fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not have any children. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not have any parents. 
Now from a theoretical perspective, why is this important? Why is it important? We know from an aqidah perspective, Allah teaches us that He is one. But from a theological perspective, why is it important to believe in the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Who can tell me? From a logical perspective, why is it important to believe in the oneness that Allah didn't have any children, nor did He have any parents? Continuation of the generation. Continuation of generation. So what if it stopped at that second generation? No, then, then uh, he'll die. Or somebody will die. Uh, Why does someone have to die? Because if somebody is created, then he'll die. A is uh, like that. Okay, I'm looking for something more. Go ahead. It's a weakness. Having children is a weakness? It could be. It could be? How so? Uh, emotions. Emotions? <laughs> <laughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves his creation more than the mothers love their children. Uh, if you're talking about that nothing can be, nothing can go on infinitely. It has to stop. Uh, that's one logical thing that there has to be the beginning of something. And nothing can have uh, an infinite number of origins or something like that. Or the other thing is that uh, if you have, you cannot have two creators or people in power in order for things to exist in a perfect system. They will. You cannot have two all-powerful beings. Right, One has to be all-powerful. Okay, excellent. So let's go with that. Go ahead, Ayman. I had an example for that. It, it was close to that answer, but example, for example, if you ask me to help you with that table, mm -hmm. and I say I will help you, example, if, if this brother helps me, okay. and he says that he will help me, and he says that he will help me, and it goes <laughs> around the whole class, and it will never end, and the last person said, if someone else will help me. It'll go on to the whole world, and it'll go on and on and on and on. It okay. will never end, right? Okay. And the table, it will never be lifted. Okay. <laughs> Interesting example. Right, let's continue. Logically speaking, why is this impossible? Number one is that you'll notice that perfection breeds perfection. So had Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if it was physically possible, had Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had a child, that child would have to be perfect. Then who would be the, cre who would be the God at that time? Would it be Allah or would it be this child? Because imperfection breeds imperfection, and perfection breeds perfection. This is where this continuum comes from. That when you have in, an infinite perfection, this perfection can never be broken off. And that is the perfection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then number two, is that who would be obeyed? That what if the son wanted one thing, and the father wanted something else? Who do you obey at that time? And this is where you start seeing the illogical discrepancies inside Christianity. That you know there's a discrepancy between the father and the son. So those are some of the logical discrepancies that would take place. That even logically, it is not befitting to Allah for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have a child. Then moving on to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala having parents. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala having parents. The fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't have parents, again, is a perfection for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had parents, what, it, what would it mean? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had a beginning. And there was something before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whereas when it comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's nothing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And therefore, even logically, it is not befitting. So meaning that the people who would affirm a parent for God, what existed before that God then? Meaning there was either nothing or there was something that was imperfect. And both of them are not possible when it comes to sustaining the creation. When it comes to sustaining the creation. And that is why logically it is not possible as well. Then we move on to the last verse. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ كُفُوًا أَحَدٍ And what's interesting about this verse, and we'll get this out of the way right away, is that this verse can actually be recited in two different ways. This verse can be recited in two different ways. The first way that this verse can be recited is the way I just recited it right now. And the emphasis is on the word kufu one. So, walam yakun lahu kufu one ahad. So you pronounce the wow. And this is the way the majority of the Qur'an recited it. They pronounce it with the wow. A second way of reciting this verse is walam yakun lahu kufu an ahad. So the wow is not pronounced. The wow is not pronounced. So if you ever see someone reciting it, you especially with Sheikh Hatim, you'll notice that Sheikh Hatim recites it in this way. He recites it as Kufu an Ahad, and not Kufu wan Ahad. So if you hear someone recite it, it is a valid difference of opinion. The meaning does not change, and both opinions of reciting this verse this way are valid. So that is in terms of change in recitation. Now what does it mean? In the translation they mention, 
and there is no co-equal or comparable to him. There is no co-equal or comparable to him. Meaning that when it comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is nothing like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is nothing like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this becomes a great theological discussion in terms of understanding the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I want to summarize it for you in three points bin Allahi ta'ala. When it comes to understanding the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, number one, they have to be derived from the Quran and the Sunnah. The names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have to be derived from the Quran and the Sunnah. Meaning that just because in our times, you know, something may be considered virtuous, like let's just say the, the color pink, mashallah, brother's wearing a pink shirt. The color pink is, is virtuous, right? In our time, well, I'm making this up by the way. It's a virtuous thing. So we can't say that one of the, uh, the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that he is pink. That just because it's virtuous in our time, it doesn't mean that it applies to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when it comes to deriving the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they have to be purely derived from the Quran. They have to be purely derived from the Quran. Principle number two. Principle number two is that while we affirm the meaning of these names and attributes, the howness of these names and attributes is only known to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So let me give you an example. When we talk about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being al-hayy, that He is the all-living, haya is also a, an attribute for the creation as well. Right? And you'll notice that the difference between our life and the life of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that the life of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it has no beginning, it has no end. Our life has a beginning and it has an end. So both of these attributes are, are, are affirmed, one for the creation and one for the creator. But the reality of the life of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beyond our comprehension. Like how do we understand infinity? For us to display infinity is not possible. We cannot show something that has no beginning nor something that has no end. Right? So the mind to comprehend this, it is not possible. So the howness of these attributes is only known to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we affirm the apparent meaning of these names and attributes. And this is why in the Quran there's one explicit verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala defines this for us. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Laysa kamithlihi shay. That there's nothing like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa huwa sami'u al basir. Is it wa huwa sami'u al basir? Wa huwa sami'u al alim. Is it? What's the verse in Surah Al-Nahl? Laysa kamithlihi shay, wa huwa sami'u al basir. I believe it's sami'u al basir, but we'll check that out. But in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts off this verse by saying that there's nothing like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and He is the all-hearing and the all-seeing. So for... Yeah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He starts off by saying that there's nothing like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then He affirms the sight and hearing for Himself. And this is a common trait that we share with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We hear, we hear things and we see things. But the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the hearing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is completely different from our hearing and from our sight. So that is the second thing. That the howness of these names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is only known to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. The third and last thing that we'll mention in terms of the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that these names, they are taken upon the apparent meaning. They are taken upon the apparent meaning. What does that mean? That you'll notice that when you get into theological discussions, you'll get several groups interpreting things. So one group will say, that we take it in a metaphorical way. Meaning that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that He is above His throne, this means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala conquered the throne. It doesn't mean that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is actually above His throne. So they go into interpretation. Then you get another group that takes the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala extremely literally. Extremely literally. That where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says something and it is taken literally. And then you get Ahl Sunnah, which comes in the middle, which says that we take the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon the apparent meaning. That based upon the context of the verse and what the verses are, what the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking about, we take it upon the apparent meaning. So we don't say that the names and attributes are taken literally, nor do we say they are interpreted or metaphorical. 
but rather we say they are taken upon the apparent meaning. And this is a small introduction to understanding the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if Allah gives us life, then Allah ta'ala will study these in more detail. And this is what the message of this verse is. That there is nothing like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That the, the howness of how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, there is nothing like Him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reaffirming what He said in the beginning. And you'll notice that the scholars of tafsir, they really emphasize this point. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts off the surah by saying He is Ahad. So in one word, he summarized the last verse of the surah. That he is Ahad, meaning that there is nothing like him. And then they said about As-Samad, that As-Samad is summarized in the third verse, meaning that he did not have any children, nor did he come from any parents. So they emphasized this point, and this is something I would reiterate over here. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reiterating what he said with Al-Ahad, except in a longer sentence, and showing us the power of the Qur'an, and the perfection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on how great meanings can even be conveyed with single words due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, was there anything else I wanted to mention about the virtues of this surah? Yes, the last thing, the last thing, is a reflection. What is the very first prayer that you will pray in the day? The very first prayer that you'll pray in the day. Isha? It is Fajr. Okay. Now in Salat al-Fajr, what will you pray first? The Sunnah or the Fard? Sunnah. You pray the Sunnah first. And what was the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ to recite in the, in the Sunnah prayers? What would he recite? Ahsant. He would recite Surat al-Kafirun and Surat al-Ikhlas. Okay. So now let's put this aside for one second. What is the last prayer that you will pray in the night? The last prayer that you will pray in the night? Is the Witr prayer. Excellent. And what would the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam recite in the Witr prayer? <laughs> Let's do it in the proper order. Then Kafirun and then Surah Al Ikhlas. So if he's praying three Witr, that is what that is what he's reciting. But that was the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So now it's interesting to analyze and assess why would Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam start his day by reciting Surah Al-Ikhlas and why would he conclude his night by reciting Surah Al-Ikhlas. This is one of the things that Ibn Qayyim quotes from Shaykh Al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah. He says, I heard Shaykh Al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah saying, the Sunnah prayers before Fajr act as the commencement of deeds for the day and the Witr prayer acts as the, uh, as the secession of deeds. It is for this reason that the Prophet ﷺ would recite Surah Al-Ikhlas in both of them since they gathered to, together Tawheed in knowledge and in deed. Tawheed in knowledge and intent and Tawheed in belief and motivation. Meaning that it is a constant reminder that the whole basis of your creation is to worship Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala alone. So firstly, reminding that you were created to worship Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala. Number two, it is a form of motivation that your Lord created you for this purpose and He will facilitate for you to the fulfilling of this purpose as well. And that is why the Messenger of Allah وسلم, used to start off his day by reciting Surah Al-Ikhlas and used to conclude his day by reciting Surah Al-Ikhlas as well in the Witr prayer. And Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala knows best. And with that, we will open the floor for questions. However, before we open the floor for questions, I do have some announcements. Just one announcement actually. Next week, there will, I will not be presenting the halaqa here. We have a guest speaker from out of town, a colleague of mine, Sheikh Bilal Ismail. He will be here presenting the halaqa. If I'm not mistaken, he will be talking about some of the lives of the companions, some of the lives of the companions. So he will be replacing me next week. And this is an honor and a privilege for our guest from out of town. So please, all of you that are here, uh, please do try to attend to be the Lahi Ta'ala. So that is the only announcement. And then we'll continue again two weeks from now at 7.30. And we will discuss with Allah Ta'ala Surah Al-Masad. Surah Al-Masad with Allah Ta'ala. We will discuss that in two weeks with Allah Ta'ala. That is the only announcement. And with that, we'll open up the floor for questions. Right. Uh, simple question. Uh, is there any names for Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala that uh, we didn't get from the Quran, like maybe from the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that he called Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala? Or all the names that we know come from the Quran? No, they come from the Quran and the Sunnah. So, so there are some of the names that came from the Sunnah of the Prophet and they're not mentioned in the Quran. I'm trying to think of one right now. And inshallah, when it comes to me, I'll get back to you with my time.
Go ahead. Uh, I'll repeat the question. You okay, mentioned that about the why in the Quran Allah SWT mentioned we. And he gave two reasons. One is, first one is the respect. Yes. That's uh, the, the Lord. Right. The second one is, say, the angels or some other creation. So, but it is not the uh, confliction that, like, Allah no needs anybody's help. Allah no needs anything from anybody. And right. uh, to do anything, because, as you know, the Quran said, Allah said, it be and be, right? Excellent. So, is this uh, second option, should we take out from this? Concept? I actually believe it's the more prominent answer. And because if you look at the Quran itself, it's filled with, you know, linguistic miracles. And this linguistic miracle is that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about worshipping Him, it's always in the singular. But when it talks about other actions, if other creation was involved in it, that is when it, men it is mentioned in plural. And now in terms of what you're saying, from your perspective, it seems like that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not in need of any help. And this is completely perfect. But if you look at it from another perspective, how does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give privileges and ennoble some of His creation by allowing them to do those very tasks? by allowing them to do those very tasks. And this brings me to a very important point, that even when discussing the term as-samad, as-samad we mentioned is that everyone turns to in times of need and of desperation. Imam al-Qurtubi rahimahullah commenting on this verse, he said that as-samad, even though it is a name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we cannot take, it is an attribute that we should try to have. So even though it is a name that we cannot take, it is an attribute that we should try to have. Meaning, what does that mean? that when people are in desperate needs and situations, that you should be the individual that they turn to, that you should be the, the one that is known that helps the community. And then he mentions examples, like the example of Sufyan al-Thawri, rahimahullah, that he would be like, mashallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed him with a lot of money. And the rest of the people, they didn't have this money. So Sufyan al-Thawri, when he used to have meat in his house, he would tell the people, which one of you wants meat, come and have meat. And the reason why he would do this was an implementation of this verse that people wanted meat and he wanted to be the one, the one to help the people as well. So this is the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ennobles people by allowing them to partake in some of the actions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That was a very good question. Jazakallah khair. Number three, go ahead. Chef, you mentioned there was three virtues for uh, Surah al -Fas. Do you mind repeating number two again? What was number two? How does this start off? Because I did that from memory. So what was the one that you had written down? Well, I have nothing for number two, that's why. Okay, so who was taking those? What was number two? Uh, Sorry? Yeah, the Sahabi he recited, he continuously recited Surah Al Ikhlas, and then they brought him to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and they said, Ya Rasulullah, will you not speak to him? It's as if he does not know any part of the Quran, any other parts of the Quran. So he said, Ya Rasulullah, I do this only because of my love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So then the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves you as well. Then we mentioned that one of the scholars, Al Hafid ibn Rajab, rahimahullah, he mentioned that part of Iman and loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is loving this surah in particular. And one of the ways to attain the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to love this surah. That is what the second virtue was. Go ahead, number four. Kufwan is not clear, Shaykh, if you would say something about Kufwan. Kufwan? Kufwan yourself, meaning, linguistic meaning and... Uh, linguistic meaning becomes very technical. Linguistic meaning, it has two meanings behind it. Number one, it comes from Al-Kafa'a. And al-kafa'a means to have a partner. It comes from ha to have a partner. So when you're looking for marriage, one of the things that are stipulated by the scholars is al-kafa'a, meaning that they're of a similar social status, a similar financial background, a similar educational status. That is one aspect of kufuwan. The second aspect of kufuwan comes from kafa, meaning that it is something that is similar to that thing, so a similitude. So here, what the meaning that is implied is the second one that there's nothing similar to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's nothing similar to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this refers to two things. Number one, in the essence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's nothing in this world that is only one other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's one side of kufuwan. Then the second side of kufuwan is that when it comes to the specific attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So like we mentioned, Allah's life and our life. We both have life. But the life of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it has no beginning, it has no end. Our life, it has a beginning and has an end. So in the particular details or the particular attributes 
When it comes to those attributes, there's no kufuwan, there's no similitude or something similar to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in those attributes. Okay. And Allah knows best. Can I ask one more question? Uh, you asked a question already, we do one for each person. Last one, and you can ask me after this class. Go ahead. Um, well, when you said that, like, that scholar you was reciting, a lot, a lot, a lot of times. One of the Sahaba. Yeah, um, yeah. Like, isn't there any other surahs in the Quran that like has more like virtues and uh, ikhlas? Like talks about Allah like better. There is no surah in the Quran that is purely dedicated to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. So the brother's question is that isn't there another surah that talks about the virtues of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala? And he mentioned that there's no other surah in the Quran that purely talks about the virtues of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala other than the surah. And there's no other surah that does so, so succinctly. Meaning that in four verses, you have pretty much everything that you need to know about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning that you should worship Allah alone, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one in terms of His rububiyyah and His Lordship, and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one in His asma wa sifat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did this in four verses, and there's no other surah that does it in such succinct, succinct, succinctness. <laughs> Allah ta'ala ala. So that will conclude. A reminder again, next week, Sheikh Bilal Ismail will be here. And our tafsir halaqa will continue in two weeks with Surah Al-Masad at 7.30, bi Allahi ta'ala. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa tuku ilayk. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.